and that they need a surgeon. I make that appointment um, fairly quickly after their diagnosis and then follow them through their journey. And then that's where Sue came along. Um, so Sue's new position as of this year, this year? Last year? Since January. Okay, since January. Um, she's in the oncology piece, so now I'm able to hand off my patient to her so she can follow the, continue to follow them through their journey with the oncology department. So she's been a great asset to our team. So um, kudos to her for helping me and um, help us fight with the, our way to breast cancer. Um, this is Dr. Corrigan. She's outstanding. She's one of our radiologists who works closely um, with our women who are also um, during the diagnostic phase and the breast cancer uh, new patients. So uh, she has a presentation to give. So, well, sorry, I haven't got these new lights quite. Figured That's out okay. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> like they're either off or on. Right. right. There's no window around. But welcome everybody. We'll get started. Um, so the, we're going to talk a little bit about breast health and uh, breast cancer. Um, and this would, is this is just a brief outline. So we're going to talk briefly what is breast cancer, what are the primary uh, risk factors, as well as um, signs of breast cancer that we can um, all see, as well as the clinicians, and what can we do um, to prevent, I guess, breast cancer, or if we are diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. So um, breast cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. It affects one in eight women. Uh, in their lifetime, it's the second leading cause of death in the U.S., and uh, it affects approximately 220,000 women every year, so uh, it's definitely a lot of us. It's, it's uh, so this is just a diagram um, of the breast, where we do see the, um, the structures inside the breast. So as we go from the nipple towards the chest wall, we can see the ducts, the tubular structures, and then we see this... Uh, little uh, round pink legs, which are the breast lobules. So, and when we keep it and in between, we have the um, supporting structures, the fat and the ligaments. So um, knowing a little bit of the basic anatomy of the breast helps us to understand the cancers that, will, that can develop in the breast. The main ones would be uh, ductal carcinoma, when the breast, the breast cancer arises in the ducts, and lobular carcinoma would be when it will arise in the, in the lobules. And uh, sometimes we have the terminology invasive as well, which means that um, the breast cancer has, um, um, has grown and it's, uh, it's uh, spread outside of this first primary structure, whether it be the duct, the lobule, or even the breast itself. And here on the first diagram, we see in green uh, the lymphatic system, so the lymph nodes um, and the lymphatic vessels, which would be uh, the way that breast cancer is spread in the body, so basically outside of the breast. And the most common um, sites would be uh, lung, bone, and uh, liver. And on the lower corner here on the right, we do have um, a diagram of the breast, which talks about different quadrants, and usually that's how we report any pathology in the breast in four different quadrants. Um, so like any other cancer in the body, um, breast cancer is uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells, um, like the secondary to changes in our DNA or genetic material. So these cells grow, proliferate, and they start invading uh, normal tissue. So it can start in any of the structures of the breast, and um, when it is not caught on time, it can spread in other parts of the body, primarily lung, liver, and bone. Um, what are the main uh, risk factors for developing breast cancer? Um, a lot of these risk factors, as you'll see, we cannot really control, and one of them is gender, right? Being female uh, predisposes us at the risk of breast cancer. It does happen in the male population as well, but uh, it's, it's much uh, rare. Age uh, is also a risk factor, and the older we are, there is a higher chance of uh, getting breast cancer like other cancers as well. So here we have the statistics. So in our, in our 60s, um, the chances of getting uh, breast cancer are 1 in 27 women or 4%. In early 30s, um, in late 30s, it's 1 in 233 women, so it's uh, less. Race also um, predisposes to breast cancer, and we see that the white 
uh, females are at a little bit higher risk. And then we have the African American uh, po patient population, then Hispanic and American Indian and Asian American. Also, uh, sometimes uh, race determines how aggressive um, the cancer is, and um, sometimes uh, African American patients are diagnosed at an earlier age and with more aggressive patient, more aggressive cancers. Um, other risk factors um, that we definitely cannot control our, um, our genetic predisposition to breast cancer. So we all have um, these two genes, which are called BR BRCA1 and BRCA2. Um, however, in um, some patients, they do acquire certain mutations of these genes or changes in the genes, which um, makes this um, gene the, so um, because of these mutations, we have this, uh, the cell growth or the proliferation uh, that happens, and these patients are at a much higher risk of breast cancer. And we see there that with the BRCA1 mutation, there is a 65% lifetime risk of getting breast cancer. And with the BRCA2 mutation, there is a 45% lifetime risk. Also, uh, these two mutations are highly associated with uh, ovarian cancer and um, developing a, a second uh, primary breast cancer. So um, sometimes um, a lot of these patients that uh, know and they have discovered that they have this strong family history and they have inherited uh, these mutations, they do um, undergo prophylactic mastectomy and ovarectomy. So they choose to remove uh, both their breasts and ovaries um, in order to protect themselves from acquiring um, these cancers given the high um, lifetime risk. And Angelina Jolie, you know, it's a, fa a famous person who um, ch chose to do this, you know, several years back. So, um, again, uh, family history is very important. And um, in addition to the number of the relatives that are involved, it's very important the age and diagnosis. Because, like I said, one in eight women, it's, it's quite frequent. So there could be several relatives that have breast cancer and they could just be uh, coincidental, but if uh, the relatives are um, first degree relatives, grandma, mother, and siblings, and they are in their early 30s, it does raise um, a higher concern for a genetic component and possibly um, the BRCA mutation, mutations. Um, also, if the patient has a personal history of breast cancer, they still remain at a higher risk of developing new um, new breast cancer in the same or the other breast, so three to four times more than the general population. Um, other risk factors would be radiation therapy to the chest, uh, especially at a young age, as well as exposure to um, different um, estrogens and um, dense breast tissue. Again, this is um, something that we cannot control. Um, the density of our breast is uh, predetermined genetically again, so Patients that have more dense breasts or more um, glandular tissue are at a higher risk for breast cancer. Um, so here we have a diagram that shows the different <coughs> uh, breast densities, and this is how it's reported on the mammogram report. So we're going from uh, less dense to denser <coughs> breasts. As we can see here on the uh, further right side, we see a lot of white tissue, a lot of glandular tissue, so there will be uh, a, a very dense breast, and uh, on imaging, it makes it really tricky um, to evaluate because breast cancer is white too. So we are trying to find um, a white mass on a white background. So it really makes it uh, challenging. But um, when it's predominantly fatty breast, like on the first diagram, it's a little bit easier um, from uh, a radiology perspective to to detect the the cancer. Um, other risk factors that um, we can somehow control uh, would be the um, having children. So the more children and the sooner we have the children, the, this count as positive risk factor, they decrease the risk of having breast cancer. Uh, um, again, with the menses, uh, menarche, we don't have a choice, but um, the age at first period does matter. So the sooner the period, the higher the risk of uh, breast cancer. And uh, with menopause, the later menopause, the higher risk of breast cancer. Again, this has to do with the uh, exposure to the estrogen and just the hormonal changes that happen um, during these phases. So other uh, risk factors, so uh, breastfeeding, breast uh, is um, 
believed or is found to decrease um, breast cancer and uh, again hormonal therapy whether it's in the form of the birth control or postmenopausal um, is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Um, other factors that um, we can somehow control somewhat uh, would be maintaining a healthy uh, way through diet and exercise and minimizing um, alcohol consumption. These are all uh, proven to decrease um, breast cancer. This is just um, um, a common website where uh, they do have a questionnaire and uh, if you were to fill it out, it would give you an idea or an overview of um, the, where you fall and if you are at high risk of uh, acquiring breast cancer. Um, so what are the signs and symptoms of uh, breast cancer? Um, the more obvious or more concerning um, findings would be to find a mass or a lump in the breast or if there are any skin changes, whether it be uh, redness or darkening of the breast sometimes. Um, it can look like uh, the skin of an orange or orange peel uh, appearance, or the, you can have changes in the size of a breast, whether it be smaller or um, bigger size. Sometimes this can be associated with the nipple changes um, as well, whether um, be a nipple discharge. Um, but um, rarely, um, also patients just have a funny sensation in the breast, or it just doesn't seem quite right. Uh, so there isn't actually something that they can, you know, really feel like a mass or lump. And uh, sure enough, when they come for a diagnostic workup, they do have a mass so, so, or a lesion uh, there that turns out to be cancer. So it's very important uh, to be aware um, of, in general, how your breasts feel, if they're, you know, lumpy, bumpy, or at certain times of the cycle or not. And that really helps. Um, to, what, to do the breast exams and see if there are any changes um, throughout the cycle. So um, the main things that we all can do, so be educated and the fact that you're here uh, today does fulfill this uh, requirement. So you're being educated on the uh, signs and symptoms. And then um, the second uh, most important thing would be um, to be screened. So basically to take advantage um, of the tests that we, we have that can uh, detect cancer early because the sooner it is detected, the higher the likelihood of it being treated and uh, not causing any, any problems. Um, so the um, screening exam will include a cell breast exam or, or clinical breast exam, as well as um, the diagnostic part or diagnostic imaging which would, be, would start with a screening mammogram. And if further indicated um, ultrasound or breast MRI or, and or biopsy can be additional uh, tests uh, as part of the diagnostic workup. Um, so this is just a diagram uh, to give you an idea of the difference that um, imaging can make. So as we can see here on the lower part, it's just a few millimeter uh, lesion or mass or lump that nobody can really feel, but we can uh, definitely detect on, uh, on mammograms and um, this would be something that could be palpable, you know, a couple of years uh, later and it could make a big difference in the treatment uh, of the patient as it would be presenting with a more advanced disease if we wait for the lump to be palpable. Um, so the cell breast exam, uh, it, we recommend it for all women starting in their 20s and like I mentioned before, it's more important to be aware of how the breasts feel and if there are any uh, changes throughout, throughout the month. Um, usually for premenopausal women, it's recommended four days after the menstrual cycle, again, to, to minimize the uh, change in the breast tissue uh, from the hormonal effects. And postmenopausal and pregnant women, it's just uh, a set date just to make sure that you remember um, to perform the exam every month. Um, this is just a quick diagram that um, shows how to perform um, the breast exam. Um, again, just a general overview of how your breasts look, if there are any skin changes, any uh, gross change in size, and then uh, continuous um, you know, palpation with the fingers um, just to make sure that the entire breast area is covered and um, to make sure that there are no uh, new lumps or, or, or bumps. Um, Similarly, the clinical breast exam uh, would be performed uh, by a healthcare professional. 
and it's recommended that in the young patient population, this be performed every three years, and patients older than uh, 40 years of age every year. Um, as far as the imaging um, modalities that we use, um, mammogram um, is uh, really uh, the um, main uh, screening exam which has proven to um, reduce mortality from, from breast cancer. It does involve radiation and some discomfort, however, uh, it does uh, pay in the long term, you know, um, like I, we saw in the first diagram, it really uh, can change um, the prognostics uh, of the patient because you can detect uh, cancer much earlier and also detect uh, suspicious cancer classifications which are not palpable. Uh, and this is just a, a view of the mammogram setup, which I'm sure you're familiar with. This is just uh, a routine um, the screening mammogram. So it shows the two, two views of the breast, the oblique view and then the craniocaudal view for, or from top to bottom. So this, again, is a breast that is not very dense, uh, which, is, which is a little easier uh, for us as radiologists to interpret. So the recommendations for screening uh, are a little bit different uh, from different societies, but um, the American College of Radiology and the American Cancer Society do recommend women get screening mammograms at age 40 and yearly. Um, it's important to have um, the imaging performed in the same facility if possible, because this uh, allows for comparison, direct comparison of studies, so we can really appreciate any uh, changes from year to year. Uh, if there is a strong family history of breast cancer or uh, a lot of the risk factors that we mentioned about uh, uh, before, it's important to discuss with, uh, with your healthcare provider. And um, if that's the case, sometimes screening is necessary to start five to 10 years prior to uh, when the first degree relative was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer. Um, and uh, as far as the mammograms, usually uh, our turnaround time is two to three days, but with a male, um, you know, it can be one to two weeks before you get the result of the uh, screening mammogram. We do offer um, same-day screening on Wednesday as well, which uh, I think it's, um, it, it is a great feature to take advantage of, and it minimizes the patient's anxiety about the uh, report and the result. Um, Ultrasound is uh, another imaging modality which is um, crucial in diagnosis of breast cancer. It's used as a primary um, imaging modality when the patient presents with a palpable lump. Otherwise, it's used uh, quite frequently in the diagnostic set setting. If we see something on mammogram then, uh, the, that it looks like a mass, the patient would come back for an ultrasound to further evaluate to make sure if it's a mass or, or, or a cyst. And, if it's truly a mass, ultrasound um, is a great modality to perform biopsies uh, with because it's very comfortable uh, for the patient and does not involve radiation. And it's real time, so we can definitely see the lesion while uh, we place the needle in the breast. Uh, another modality that is uh, uh, very useful and very sensitive for detection of breast cancer is MRI. Uh, again, it's primarily used in the diagnostic setting, but for patients that have a very uh, strong family history of breast cancer or a lot of these risk factors, uh, MRI can also be used in the, in the screening setting. So extremely high risk patients can be screened. Um, and also patients that are diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, sometimes MRI is important to make sure that there are no um, cancers in the other breasts or multiple cancers, small cancers in the same breast, and this will, will change the, the patient's treatment. Um, so again, uh, briefly at CGH, we do offer uh, digital mammography. As of next year, we will be offering uh, 3D mammography as well. Uh, and um, the, the, the workup um, will, does include diagnostic mammography if um, there is a need for if the patient gets called back as well as the ultrasound and uh, MRI, including uh, biopsies with all these uh, modalities. And um, like Erica mentioned, she um, is part of our team and together with the oncology, the nurse navigators make sure that there is continuity of care 
uh, for all our uh, patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer and they make sure uh, that the radiology team, oncology and surgical teams, they're all um, you know, aware and are coordinating uh, patient's care. Um, and we do also have Saturday appointments um, just to, to make sure for the uh, women that are working um, that they can get their uh, screening mammograms. Um, do you guys have any questions? My big question, which is probably going to go to her. Okay. I just watched a program on public channel, channel called Oceans of Pink. Okay. And it's about a pro a uh, group of women. There were four thousand of women that attended this. It's called Dragon Boat Racing, but it's all got to do with breast cancer. And they said the biggest problem with Hispanic people, women, mm -hmm. is that they they finally get to the doctor to get a mammogram. And they discover that they have a problem. But it seemed in this program that the care was dropped mm -hmm. because they didn't have insurance, they didn't have you know, care for the family. And have you encountered any of that around here? So uh, nationally, that's a problem regardless of race because uh -huh. of, um, and that's how navigation came about was because of the um, people with a lower income don't have insurance and so they don't have, they have their screening but they can't afford the workup. Right. So um, that's where a lot of organizations come up with funding and um, so that's why CJH offers free mammogram screenings and as of May 1st of this year, the Health Foundation is now helping women um, pay for their diagnostic workup. Okay. So if you don't have insurance, um, and even if you do have insurance, um, they will pay for your diagnostic mammogram and or ultrasound during the diagnostic phase. So you had your mammogram, your screening mammogram, the radiologist found a problem, now they need to call you back for additional imaging. The foundation is now covering that. Okay. Um, if we find a woman who needs help after that, as far as they need a paying for their biopsy or they need money to help pay for their surgery, that's a case-by-case -case situation. Obviously, we'll have them fill out financial aid paperwork because uh -huh. even if you have the best insurance in the world, you still qualify for some sort of financial aid. And then the women who really need it, that need the help, I forward their name, her name to Sherry and also the Health Foundation. And again, they look at that case by case to help the individual. But no woman should go without care because of the, they can't afford the diagnostic phase. So we have tried to eliminate that because uh -huh. that is a discovery, um, which is why our Health Foundation um, has raised money with, through private donors and events like Delicious Designs that we just had last week to help women with that funding. Okay. So yes, that is a delay and that's that's across all care, regardless of just breast cancer. But yeah, well, this was really brought up because there was quite a few black right. women and Hispanic in this program that were. And so that's how navigation <laughs> started initially. Was it in the inner city um, that they were seeing that women who didn't have insurance or have any money weren't getting the proper care, and they were dying of stage four breast cancer at a young age because they just didn't have the money to afford their care right which that yeah. is unacceptable we have to find a way to help those people right that's areas. what that program was kind yes. of about yes so that's why um you know we have a lot of funding that can assist any woman who needs it um to help with any barriers which is a financial barrier right okay so the other question i had and i don't want to take the whole room but no you're good um, about 25 years ago i was in a breast cancer trial program that had to do with tamoxifen. Are they still using tamoxifen to treat or to prevent breast Absolutely cancer? Absolutely they are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So women who are diagnosed with breast cancer that don't qualify to have chemo or anything because it's early stage, a preventative from cancer to further grow or to get it somewhere else, they put them on tamoxifen up to five years. Mm -hmm. And Sue can answer that as well. They, she has a ton of patients on tamoxifen. So it's actually a very good drug to still fight breast cancer. So okay. thank you for trialing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the pill, but as it turned out, but I was yeah. on this program for five years hmm. to so, see yeah. if it would be helpful or not. 
So yes, it's still an effective drug. It's still in practice. It is still recommended for use. Okay. So yes, good question. Any others? Next. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about the pamper bags? Very yes. Fast. So um, a pamper bag is a, a bag that is full of all kinds of goodies. I don't have one with me. But the Health Foundation, we are finding, we're trying to find ways to help women when they're newly diagnosed with breast cancer, going to oncology. What can we do to make that transition to having chemo, losing your hair, all these side effects of chemo? How can we make that better for them um, to make them comfortable? So we had a couple of survivors um, who kind of gave us their input on what would be beneficial to put in a pamper bag. And they came up with socks, lip balm, um, headphones, so they can listen to music or a movie, um, mints. Um, oh, there's a cup in there. Yeah, like a, a cup with a straw that- I pack them so I know yeah, what's in there. Yeah, I want to know in there. <laughs> so those are all feedback from survivors. They're the, squeezy pops for like right. when they're having nausea. Yes, yes, yes. So there are all kinds of, for any sort of symptom that they may have for care, the, um, the other thing that I suggested that moved me was I had a friend that I work with. Her sister was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she lived in Chicago, and her sister who lived here had a lot of questions, and she couldn't make a teleappointment. So she asked me if I would sit down with her for five minutes and kind of go over some questions she had that she couldn't make an appointment, but someone here could answer. So I sat down with her and answered questions. Um... And then after we were all done, she was very thankful for me answering questions. She pulled out a pink army guy. Um, and if you're familiar with the toys, and they're usually green army guys for little boys who want to play, you know, army or war. But these were pink. And um, when she handed it to me, she's like, oh, thank you. Now you're part of my sister's, um, you're a soldier in my sister's battle against cancer. And it moved me. And it's just a little plastic army guy, but it meant a lot to me because all I did was answer questions. But anyone who helped her through her journey, she gave a pink army guy to her doctors, her nurses, her family, her friends, her loved ones. So it, it really moved me. So I'm like, you know what? I would like to give patients a bag of their own army guy so they can hand out because it's very important to have a good support system going through this because um, people who are diagnosed with breast cancer oftentimes feel, you know, that they're alone and um, they're different all of a sudden. We gotta make sure they don't feel that way. So I give them a bag of these pink army guys and I take one out because I'm the first soldier in their army to fight their cancer and hopefully they get those out. And a little poem, you can probably recite right. the poem, but the poem, oh, I read it once and I cried and I can't read it. <laughs> it's very moving and, and a lot of people like the army guys, so. And that was just because I received one and it meant a lot to me. So so thank you again for helping me out. Yeah. yeah, so any ideas for a pamper bag that, um, you know, until you're in those shoes, you don't really know what they need or require. Um, we, we like to make it as comfortable as possible for that process. The other thing the Health Foundation helps fund um, is all of our education to our uh, patients as far as why you're being called back um, what to expect when you're first diagnosed with breast cancer, how to pick your surgeon, how to decide what surgery is appropriate for you, uh, how it can affect your relationship with your husband, or how do you tell your children you have breast cancer, or um, this book kind of helps you step by step from start to finish, even survivorship, which is after you've gone through all the treatment and the fear of living, is it going to come back? So this, this book is outstanding. Um, I go to seminars annually. Um, it's the same, a lot of facilities, the same education, and it's very good. And so, again, they sponsor us to be able to provide that to our patients, and we're very grateful for the foundation because they do a lot for our patients. So, and Joan's not here, but Sherry, you're part of it. <laughs> I pay the bills. When Absolutely. I don't pay the bills, I say, pay this much. Pay this That's much. That's all I do. <laughs> I do all work. Yeah. <laughs> Not really, but a lot of it. So a question that came up earlier um, was, what age do you stop 
having a family. Oh, that's a good one. And that came up with a lot of my older generation. So as long as you're healthy and well, you should get a mammogram screening. The rule of thumb is if you plan to live the next five years, you need to have a mammogram. Okay? So you're never too old. My mother-in-law was 90. Yeah. And the older you get, your chance, your risk goes up. But you're never, yeah. If you are, if you're already healthy and, and living and living a well life, you need, uh, you need to get your screening mammogram. Yeah, my grandmother was in her 80s, the way. Yeah. She just had a lump under her arm. Yeah. So quality of life. There's a lot of nine-year-olds that are running around that look like they're 70, and if you they're if they're doing great and doing well, then it's, I mean, obviously the pros and cons, but you're never too old. Is what I want to say. I try to focus on the 40-year-olds, but it's the it's that 70, 80 range that you're. Yeah. Nervous. More of us are hitting it too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it today, so I feel the muscles are all good. <laughs> but so thank you for coming and having our, our attention. Um, and anything else anybody has to add? What did they do before there was mammograms? Like, <laughs> before they. It would be basically palpable, right? The woman, when the woman felt or the clinician felt it, then it was more of a surgical disease, and that's, you know, it's tricky because it's already advanced. Did people right? just die without any symptoms? Well, they had more adva advanced breast cancers, right? Even though sometimes they used, uh, they did surgery, and even very aggressive surgeries in the beginning when we didn't um, have all the research that showed that. Uh, lumpectomy and mastectomy are actually very, you know, it's the same outcome at the time. You know, before we had all these research, they used to do very extensive surgery, even removing the muscle, you know, going all the way to the rib cage to make sure to prevent, you know, breast cancer from reoccurring. Uh, but obviously, time and research showed that that was not necessary. You know, you don't have to go to that uh, extensive uh, surgery in order to prevent the cancer. You know, lumpectomy and radiation, um, it's actually equal to mastectomy, you know, so you don't have to have that invasive surgery. But yeah, to answer your question, it was primarily a surgical <coughs> disease. If they felt <coughs> something, they went in there, you know, they biopsied and they <coughs> removed what they, they could feel. Well, two natural <coughs> things I totally believe in is um, not wearing any chemical arm dealer, <coughs> baking soda, or if you shave your armpits, cornstarch and it won't burn. It's just one ingredient that your lymph nodes <coughs> lets you get rid of the toxin. And I totally believe in no polyester bras. <coughs> the skin has got to breathe. So the key takeaway from then to now is what that hasn't changed is be familiar with your own breasts. You're going to notice, <coughs> if you're familiar with your breasts, you're going to notice a change. So you can catch it early if you know if you do notice a change. Anything you feel a change or you feel alarmed, you should always have a clinical clinical breast exam by your physician and have it looked into. Well, I had pain for three months and they said there was nothing, but then she just said to go down to one cup of coffee and it's almost gone. Yes, caffeine. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. What Meredith Johnson? Yes, caffeine plays a right? major effect on uh, breast tissue sensitivity. So the vitamin E stopped it for like two years, but now she's got me an evening and primrose. Mm -hmm. Is that helping? That's supposed no, to help. The evening and primrose is causing hot flashes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, caffeine intake can affect your sensitivity to breast. So if you drink tons of coffee and you have sensitive breasts, <laughs> back off a little bit, you'll see the difference. Well, vitamin E really shrink it? That's what I was told. Shrink? Yeah, it helps shrink. <coughs> shrink normal, healthy breast tissue, or? No, if you got a, if you got a lump, it helps shrink it. No, unfortunately, that's not true. <coughs> you come here wrong. <coughs> Everyone signed up for their mammogram? Yeah, or have you did that? I'm not doing it. <coughs> It is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so we are giving out free October, yeah. um, 
My nails, <laughs> any of your kids. <laughs> I was going to say socks. I forgot. <laughs> yeah, socks was last year. Last year was, was manicure kids. <laughs> right. And cookies. And cookies. Delicious. Over every year. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.